Um, I'll, I'll try to minimize the intro, but I, uh, we're a group on uh, material science um, and engineering at MIT. So we care about atoms that move around, right? Our, our resolution for most of our problems are, are atoms. Um, and we try to habitate this continuum that goes from uh, you know, solving all laws of physics that you already knew with a computer, which is just too expensive. It extrapolates great. I think the Apple example was brilliant, right? Like trying to learn gravity from, uh, from example seems very, very wasteful. And at the opposite of the spectrum, we just can throw, you know, like, like we saw maybe from, from uh, Pyle yesterday, right? Like, turns out if you've got a billion data points, uh, you can work out some magic, even if, if one doesn't sort of need to figure out the underlying rules of the game. Um, so we operate in this, uh, in this continuum, uh, trying to either put a little bit of machine learning into high throughput simulations that we would do by brute force, or putting a little bit more first principles in, in machine learning approaches, um, such like multi-fidelity models, or, or maybe um, you know, inf infusing uh, inductive biases into machine learning models. And this is typically at the service of, of material design. So uh, we would call victory if we find out you know, something that goes into your car, something that goes into a filter, something that goes into, into industry. Um, and I've been thinking about emergence when, when sort of the topic came out. I was like, what do, we, what do we have to do with emergence? So I feel like there is sort of two, two ways that, uh, that things emerge in, in the way we're working. I would say there is sort of weak emergence, which may be just generalization um, or, or maybe inductive bias, which is w there is things we know happen and we would like to get them back when we make a surrogate model, right? And, and it relates back to all the things we've, we've heard about sort of learning uh, and reduce the representations. And, there is, there is phenomena that we already know should emerge, so how do we make sure that, that they appear when we train on limited sizes? And, and maybe again, um, going back to Mohammed, turns out you can train on small proteins and get sort of large uh, protein behavior. That's great, we already knew uh, that was supposed to happen. So it's great. And then maybe, maybe I think the emergence uh, we were asked about yesterday in the example with the, with the bubbles that lit up, uh, is sort of this, this hard emergence. It's like, well, I didn't even know that was supposed to happen. Uh, but it turned out that I managed to sort of get something that generalized enough to, to get there. So I think I have an example of, of each and, and many examples where, where it didn't work. And, and the, the thing we're sort of typically most excited about in, in this context is, is auto-differentiation and learning things end-to-end, -end, typically piping them through some inductive bias. So, so sometimes we control the nature of the functions we're auto-differentiating through and learning. Um, and typically, one of the things that we typically learn is going to be uh, interatomic potentials. And, and you know, uh, um, I will just talk very little about interatomic potentials because uh, a lot of people know more than, than we do about this here in the room. So, just to preface, like I said, everything we do is, is atomistic, right? That's the, the resolution of the world we care about. And the differential equations that we solve are kind of lousy <laughs> compared with sort of the diversity and the richness of, of the systems of differential equations we just saw. Uh, we're, we're moving Hamiltonian dynamics forward in time, right? Turns out this is expensive, right? We, we need to do it one femtosecond at a time. So it's, uh, that's why we, we want to be, you know, we, we ideally want, would want to skip frames, right? Or integrate with longer time steps or move fewer particles around. So this is, this is all the places where we and many others are trying to inject machine learning into molecular dynamics. How, we, how do we escape these constraints of moving uh, all the atoms explicitly, one femtosecond at a time, or even lower, right? If you're doing ring polymer, it's the same story, right? Like, turns out now you're integrating 0 0.01 femtoseconds at a time, right? So how do, how do we fast forward in time, or worry about fewer particles, or use uh, cheaper Hamiltonians? So learning cheaper Hamiltonians is something uh, with, or cheaper potentials, uh, is something we, we spent a lot of time thinking about. I'll, I'll just show a couple of recent examples. Um, where at the end of the day, the nature of the task is learning a surrogate for quantum mechanics. So, so our potential is as good as it can be and as cheap as, as it can be. Turns out neural networks are very good at this. Uh, other people have, have pioneered this. I would just have one example that uh, uh, plugs into, the, into Simon's poster so you can ask him all the hard questions. This would be an example, for instance, where we only get emergence when we explicitly put in the behavior we know is important. So this, this is about uh, the molecules in your glasses. If, if you've got glasses that change color uh, when you go outside, that's, that's a molecule that's called a photochrome that switches conformations upon irradiation. It's, it's a, a pretty complicated photochemical process where the molecule gets excited and uh, the 
initial geometry that was a minima in the ground state is not a minima anymore in the excited state, so the molecule undergoes a motion in the excited state. Ah, let me get a pointer, sorry. I do have a pointer. Let's see if I can make this pointer work. No. Sorry, I apologize. Here you are. No, 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 I'm getting there. Uh, there. So the, the system evolves up to this crossing point, and at this crossing point, it can either decay back to the original geometry in the ground state or cross over and, uh, and reach a different geometry in the ground state. Right? So this, this is a complex phenomenon. It can, simulate it can be simulated with excited state potentials. Uh, so we trained them, and it turned out we, wouldn't, we weren't getting the right behavior unless we enforce our inductive bias about what matters in the loss. We, we had to sort of work out, instead of the regular training laws that one would use to fit quantum mechanics, we had to add terms that we know matter. We know we're going to need them later on, uh, such as the non-adiabatic coupling vector about sort of how the surfaces couple. So we had to sort of come in and embed a lot of structure into the problem by learning um, non-adiabatic states that then can get diabatized inside the neural network to produce the energy surfaces that we care about. So I, I would just ask, you know, if you're interested in this, ask Simon for the details. But this is an example where in order to get the emerging behavior that we knew was supposed to occur, we had to come in and, and enforce it in the structure of the, of the learning problem. This is a, an example where I, I'm excited with because I was thinking about this. We did see some emerging behavior for this particular system. So this is a GPS. It's a, a proposed material that could be a solid ionic conductor to make batteries that don't catch fire, which is kind of pretty amazing. They still ask you if you have a, a Samsung phone when you get on a plane. Um, so, th for instance, they would be very happy to get a, a solid material in their batteries that doesn't burn. Um, so my, the red points here are people simulating at, uh, how folks simulate the ability of this material to conduct lithium. So the, uh, the y-axis is how well lithium moves around, and the x-axis is temperature. And this is, this is what traditional quantum mechanical theory was saying. So you know, get this, this type of trend. And then the experiments are here in black. The slope are similar, that's OK, but there's an order of magnitude difference. So somehow theory was missing, like something was happening, and, and an order of magnitude performance was missing. And that was surely happening in the region where there was no coverage, right? So the experiments end before the theory begins. So there was no crossing point. So this is an example where we trained, you know, we used this type of data to train a surrogate that was cheap enough that we could deploy and, and get the green points, right? So we could sort of cover up phase space, different temperatures that weren't uh, uh, accessible before. We could simulate a much larger unit cell. It was four by four by four, like 5,000 atoms, instead of the one by one tiny 50 atom unit cells. And it turns out when you do that, there is a phase transition in the way the lithium moves around this material. I won't even spend a lot of time talking about sort of the nature of phase transition. But it turns out this phase transition was not observable at this scale uh, because they weren't getting to the right temperature and the right unit cell sizes to actually see, right? The, the system was too arrested by, by simulating that too small unit cell. So when the system is big enough, and, and you can simulate uh, long enough at, at uh, the right temperatures, it turns out this phase transition was seen. So to me, this, this was a good example of emergence, right? There was this complex behavior. It's a phase transition, which is sort of something that, that's typically uh, unexpected or hard to see. Uh, and we got it by training on this type of data. And without enforcing any type of behavior, we saw this, this uh, switch over between the two modes. So that, that's a place where I think we've, we've, uh, we can say that there was complex behavior emerging by just and, and was observed by us training on, on some limited phase space and, and taking this model to a, to a larger phase space. Moving up in the, in the rank of sort of things that <clears throat> um, one can do end to end, um, in terms of training these potentials, I don't know if folks have experience, um, it's really hard. Neural networks are very brittle uh, and they, they struggle to generalize. We all know that very well. And in the case of, of molecular simulations, that means that they typically produce, um, the, the, the failure mode is typically, they move far away from the training data, they return to the mean, mean is kind of zero, and they dump all the, all the energy that the system had. Uh, the potential energy goes to zero, the neural network is like, ah, I don't know, zero energy. All that becomes kinetic energy and the system explodes because it goes to a temperature of a million degrees. So that type of behavior, we've encountered it many times, I'm, I'm sure other people have, meaning that one ends up having to essentially have the same distribution of phase space in the training data, 
that one needs at inference. But if one already has visited all the phase space at train time, then why would you even run the simulation? You, you already have all the phase space. You just reweight it and, and you get your answer. So how do you how do you make this interplay between the original training data and, and the rare phenomena that you want to see at, uh, at inference? Um, and that to us has meant uh, uncertainty and active learning. Um, so many folks are, are applying these ideas of Bayesian uh, force fields and, and uncertainty quantification. At the end of the day, there's kind of three or four ways to do it. Um, typically, I have a summary there from, from a draft that, uh, that we're putting together, so the paper's not out yet, but uh, I think I prefer this point there. Um, but um, at the end of the day, the thing that has typically worked the best is, is ensembles. So Monte Carlo works well, maybe for some machine learning applications, standard machine learning applications, but dropout Monte Carlo is not good enough for, for these potentials. Um, mean variance estimation doesn't really work because we don't have aleatoric noise. We only have epistemic noise. Our DFT simulations, if you run them again, you get the same number with machine precision with 10 to the minus 6 uh, 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 error. So we don't have an um, uh, um, aleatoric uncertainty problem. Uh, evidential regression has gotten excited in the, in the last uh, um, couple of years. It can learn the aleatoric and the epistemic terms at the same time. So it's, it's there. It hasn't been quite tested for, for force fields. And then uh, folks do versions of distance in the latent space as an uncertainty measure. So it's like if you're far away from your training data, you're probably uncertain. And, and you can do this sort of by, by fitting a Gaussian mixture model to the, to the latent space. So we've spent a lot of time, and, and again, maybe this is sort of we're not getting emergent behavior because we're having distribution shift between our training data and our inference data. So the way we've taken to sort this is, well, we, we need active learning. For active learning, we need to know when the model is uncertain. So we need to quantify uncertainty, which there are some tools here. And then we need to go sample uncertain points. And again, if you already have all the whole phase space, to score uncertainty, you've already visited the whole phase space. So again, you would have answered the question by then. Um, and the solution that we propose to this is the same uh, auto-differentiation game, but over uncertainty. It turns out all the uncertainty measures I proposed earlier are differentiable, right? That they're written in torch, in the same language you wrote your neural network potential in the first place, meaning they're differentiable too. So we've, uh, we've played around with, well, this, this is literally just the equation for, uh, for the ensemble uncertainty. And this is a, a likelihood based on the visited points of the simulation. So this is sort of a, a fake partition function just based on, on, the, based on the phase space the world and the, the model has seen so far. It's not all of phase space, but based on what it's seen so far, I can sort of assign a likelihood to any new point I visit with its own error. And with this, I can quantify the uncertainty I have in my prediction. So if I put these two things together, I get sort of this, this likelihood weighted uncertainty, and I can go follow that gradient. Because everything was differentiable in the first place, I can literally take the gradient of, of the product of this likelihood times this uncertainty, and just go uphill uh, in uncertainty, or in, in calibrated and in, in likelihood weighted uncertainty to do active learning. Turns out this is an adversarial attack. People do this all the time in, in, uh, in images to make sure that, uh, that the images one is learning are robust with respect to adversarial attacks uh, where, where you know, they, they change two pixels in a stop sign and it becomes a, a, a maximum speed 180 miles per hour. So in order to protect uh, image uh, machine vision algorithms against adversarial attacks, people do this at train time we can sort of utilize the same engine to, to find new points. So we've got a couple of examples. I, I maybe won't belabor the point too much into sort of how much this helps, but we found that it typically helps. So this is, this is a, a two-well uh, system where we have run sort of regular molecular dynamics in the first well, so we've never seen that there is a second well out there. Uh, but we know that sort of things get uncertain as you get closer to the border. We gather a few points that are locally, local optima in uncertainty by gradient ascent from here. Um, relabel them, and it turns out the second uh, well gets, uh, gets identified uh, with better accuracy and at a faster pace than if we were doing uh, some, some random sampling. Uh, Rafa, I yeah. have a question here. How do you create the attacks? How do Maybe I create? Maybe I mean the adversarial attacks. Do we just choose, it? so we already have some starting ensemble of points that come from somewhere. So some of those, the ones that were in test, are taking us seats to start the, the uphill ascent from there. 
So it's uh, so it follows the formal formulation of adversarial samples that they fool the classifier or some other predictor that you are relying yes, on. Yes. So our, our own energy predictor, right? So these are the forces that we predict from our from our neural network potential. These are the energies that we predict from our neural network potential. So we literally take the test points that we say for test uh, that we use for for evaluating the model. And from those, we see the search for the next generation of things that the model is bad at, or, or max, maximally uncertain about. Um, again, we're competing with a world where we, you would take the model, do molecular dynamics forever, find the places where it was uncertain, take them back, put them back into the model. So the, the baseline here would be train a model, use it to the full extent you were going to need it, see where it was wrong, retrain again. So we were competing with having to do the full inference uh, at every round of learning. And here, by, by just doing actual gra gradient ascent, we get a flavor for, for the, where the local optima are. We've tested this in... in yeah. Was that just one cycle where you trained a model, did the adversarial, ran a bunch, ran a bunch more of uh, higher quality calculations, or did you have to go through multiple cycles? We need to do multiple cycles all the time. I took out, I have, I have my... my baseline of nine generations of full uh, molecular dynamics. So nine generations of MD, choose some frames, retrain, MD, choose some frames, retrain. So typically it's taking us sort of seven, eight, nine generations to make sure that things actually are robust enough to go answer complex problems. So it's multiple rounds all the time. Um, but this is not the only tool, but it's become a standard tool now that we use in the group to, to go find the improved potential. This is another example. Um, the traditional thing I just described, so we train the, the first, uh, we train sort of the same model. Um, we can add 5,000 points at random from neural network dynamics, or from just phase space uh, uh, as, as the molecular dynamic simulation would visit, or a tenth of that um, from adversarial attacks, and the, the stability of the trajectories improves much more with fewer points if they are chosen to belong to this sort of um, local maxima in, in uncertainty. Just doing in the acquisition, you're just doing one one point at a time, or you do like batch acquisition. It's batch. I think for more, for uh, and this, uh, sorry, I had a, a little bullet point earlier about this. It's batched um, because neural networks won't even see that extra point, right? If, we're training on tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. So adding one a is not going to move the waste too much, and it's extremely wasteful. So typically, we we do you know. Depending on the budget, but every generation might be, you know, the order of hundreds of or a thousand. And so the gradient descent, you're like, you're doing gradient descent on a batch, or it's a. We just we just choose independent points. We choose sort of from from the pool of test points we had. We choose we shoot up a bunch of paths, right? We go different starting points, so we can shoot up uh, different paths from them, and then make sure that sort of they're different, right? You can cluster after or before, to make sure that. Uh, so we end up with a batch. But the process to acquire them could be serial, as long as, as the batch together makes sense. Right? So we can, do, we can launch the attacks one after the other, or all at the same time. It is more practical to do them all at the same time, because if they fit in memory. Right? You, can, you can do like 500 of these in memory at the same time, depending on the system. Uh, but yeah, what comes out of this is a set of points, all of which are local optima in this likelihood weighted uncertainty. Um, how much do these uncertainty metrics help? Well, it turns out that, that none of them are great. And depending on what system you test, you get different uh, winners. Ensembles are typically more robust. Uh, so if we, we tend to default to ensembles, but they're also n times pricier than, than the regular single model, because it's as, as hard as running n. All the other ones kind of cost the same. MVE is typically the worst for us because, like I said, we don't have aleatoric uncertainty. So we sort of, this, this is not what this model was supposed to do. But again, when we compare sort of things like the Sperman correlation between uncertainty and error, like they're all kind of. So I would say I, have, I don't have a solution, but I definitely have a question to the communities. How do we quantify sort of sensitivity of systems to the new points that come in? in a better way than, than this. Right? These uncertainty measures are not really too correlated with error, and they're not too helpful to know how much information you're getting from doing more active learning. So I would say this is something we're curious about, and, and if people have thoughts about uncertainty and, and, and information gain, uh, we'd, be, we'd be excited to learn more. Another maybe shout out at, uh, at Emergence. So we've trained, uh, you know, we've got 
uh, uh, sponsors that care a lot about, uh, about uh, a certain type of chemistry. This is uh, the precipitation of silica in water is, is sort of a reaction. The little sachets that you get when you buy something with silica in them, it turns out making those is a big business and, and people really want to know how, to, how that's made for precipitated silica. Um, so we've trained, we set up to train a, a machine learning potential for that needs to be reactive for this sort of uh, silica chemistry in water. So this is a condensed phase thing with you know, thousands of atoms at the same time, water, silica. And um, I insisted, and, and the students <laughs> could be convinced, that we wanted to train on molecular simulations of clusters. Right? So this is an emergence example where we trained a force field on atomic clusters of you know, 20, 50, 60, 100 atoms and put together a potential that generalizes to bulk. Um, and the way we did active learning is in these settings, because now when we do the actual production simulations in bulk, uh, we cannot throw that back to the Oracle again. So we did something like, uh, like GradCam for attribution to attribute uncertainty. So we could take that same uncertainty and apply it locally, right? So what is the environment? So you can see here in this particular example, this is uh, 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 water that has sort of a very close, um, very acute angle between the hydrogen bonds that was visited during the simulation. It wasn't sort of in the training data. So we get sort of this red flag that this chemical environment is uncertain. So we can extricate this out, send it to the Oracle, and we don't need to simulate the whole bulk. We can just punch the little holes in uncertainty. Um, so this is an example of training sort of from small atomic clusters to a bulk system. And it turns out the bulk came out pretty good. So this is the radial distribution function uh, for, uh, for water. We get more or less the right density compared with DFT. We get, the, the I think, one of the best diffusivities that folks have gotten for, for water. Um, like I said, it's a reactive water, so we can, uh, we can uh, do molecular dynamics and enhance sampling and quantify the free energy difference between uh, water and, and uh, the auto-ionization. We get the, the uh, plus one, plus minus one pK unit um, uh, as expected without nuclear quantum effects. We can put nuclear quantum effects with, uh, with ring polymer uh, dynamics if we wanted, and we get sort of good behavior for bulk. Um, silicate, so like actual solids that are made of pure silica and that are crystalline, and we get the right energetics from this force field that was drained from the, from the bottom up with molecular clusters. So I, I would count this as a, as a again, the, the behavior we want, we were aware of what behavior we expected to emerge, but we, it, emerged, it emerged without us enforcing that all these things had to happen. Right? So we got the right diffusivity without fitting to diffusivities. And, and this takes me to my uh, last point in this sort of world of neural network potentials. This, this is a, uh, something that was led by, by Chiam. It did not get into ICLR for some reason. Um, but, uh, but I think this, the statement stays, which is that forces are not really a great way to quantify success for all these neural network potentials. Right? Getting the right energies, getting the right forces, is not a very good metric of success uh, because the potentials, you know, we want them to do something with them. So we're, that the task that we actually want to do with them is not getting the right forces, it's getting the right thermodynamic behavior, right? The right ensembles. And there is, I mean, there is an obvious example here that, that does horrible, uh, which is one, ForceNet. ForceNet is a neural network that is trained to reproduce forces straight up without being energy conserving. And it looks very good at, at held out data because you know it, it learns the exact same thing you have in there. So it, it kind of does okay on the force benchmarks, but it's not energy conserving, right? And it turns out energy conservation doesn't emerge. If, if you learn just forces, you don't get energy conservation for free, unfortunately. So ForceNet seems okay on, on force benchmarks, but it really, it really doesn't do a good job at, uh, at doing molecular dynamics. Um, what am I doing? Good. I, I want to mention a couple more things, see if I have time for everything. Sort of in, in the ratcheting up, uh, the, the complexity or, or and maybe ratcheting down the usefulness of these things. Um, there, is, uh, there is differentiable molecular dynamic simulations. This is something that multiple people are intrigued by. It's not clear what sort of the winning application is yet, uh, but, but we continue to be intrigued by it. And this is the idea, and again, I got my, my sort of one uh, um, uh, differential equation that we're solving here in Hamiltonian dynamics uh, back in 2019, uh, Dubeno and, and company proposed 
uh, uh, that one can apply the adjoint method to the time evolution of an ODE, meaning that we can essentially take the derivative of some loss with respect to some parameters. What is this loss? It can be a neural network potential, and I have examples of this, but it could be other things. And so we can take the derivative of some Hamiltonian simulation or some loss across uh, the length of a Hamiltonian uh, um, uh, molecular simulation with respect to some parameters that we want to fit, uh, applying the, the adjoint method. So we define the surrogate system, uh, we just pay a, a constant memory price, and we get to sort of simulate. So our earlier examples were sort of, you know, forcing this, forcing this uh, learning the potential that makes this uh, chain of beads fold into a helix, right? So again, this is the potential whose thermodynamic equilibrium state is folding this guy into a helix, which it's intriguing, but haven't, we haven't sort of quite found, or, or we, or maybe collectively, uh, a nice application for it, right? It works, but what, what are sort of winning applications? One thing we tried is to fit um, interatomic potentials from experimental data, right? So you can take the radial uh, uh, distribution of uh, oxygen, 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 hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen in water, and fit an interatomic potential whose equilibrium evolution fits these, uh, these RDFs. Um, and it turns out it's possible, and we get, when we take that potential and we run with it, we get back the, the right structure of water. And, and this sort of uh, it set us into a, a theoretical study that, that we recently put out on sort of learning pair potentials for these things. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Henderson's theorem, but it turns there is a one to one mapping between a, a, an interatomic potential, between a pairwise potential and a radial distribution function. Uh, and, and the student was like, Alpha, this, this, this is sort of written in stone. There is a one to one mapping, which is true, but it turns out it's extremely sensitive. So you can see in all these plots, we, we, we set up potentials that, you know, again, the, maybe in the spirit of reproducing the truth you know, right? We set up uh, Leonard Jones potentials and we try to relearn them with differentiable molecular dynamics. And it turns out, sure, we relearn a big array, a wide array of uh, interatomic potentials that produce the same radial distribution function. The tails are different, right? Like, so uh, uh, all these potentials that you, hear, you see here in, uh, in blue produce these radial distribution functions. So you can see all the radial distribution functions overlap. So they produce the right structure, but it turns out they're not the, the right uh, um, uh, interatomic potential that we're starting with. So a little bit of, of cold water. This applies also to other ways of learning them, right? So I think this, this sensitivity is a general problem. It's not something that, that comes out of from deep sim. Um, but it's, uh, I think the, the way of the, doing this end-to-end -end allowed us to see sort of this sensitivity in a way that had not possible with, with tools like Boltzmann inversion. And then other conclusion of these are, for surprise, surprise, the more phase space you show it at train time, the more robust the, the interatomic potential does learn. So there are no surprises there, but training over multiple state points, multiple densities, multiple temperatures, uh, makes collectively makes for a, for a better interatomic potential. And then maybe if, if I don't have too much uh, more time. Oh my goodness, this microphone. Um, I wanted to put in my, in my jacket, but uh, they said not to. Here we go. Um, and then there is another poster for this outside. So again, if, if you've got sort of hard questions, you can ask them to Johannes uh, and Martin. Well, Martin is not here, but. Um, and the preprint is out too. And this is the idea of using differentiable simulations for barrier crossing. So typically in order to simulate barrier crossings from a, from a, a reactant to a product. So the premise here is I have a reactant and a product state. If I don't know what the product is, we, this, this is not the tool for it, right? So the premise is I know what my, my reactant basin is and I know what my product basin is. So I've got a way to know if I'm in one or in the other. Um, typically the way to do this would be to choose some collective variables, some a small uh, uh, low dimensional combination of the degrees of freedom of the system and do enhanced sampling across this collective variable such that we can one gets to overcome uh, the barrier and see the rare event that gets you from A to B. Um, meaning that one needs a strong prior for what this collective variable is. And one typically needs to know what the, uh, have an intuition for the path that this is going to take. So we set out to see if these differentiable molecular simulations can help find out the, the path that takes you from, a, you know, from 
uh, A to B uh, without having a strong prior for the, for the path. And the way we do this is uh, essentially trying doing a, a molecular dynamic simulation and then applying the adjoint method to take the, the gradient of the biasing potential across the path of the, of the simulation, seeing if it crosses. So we, we set out to maximize the likelihood of a path starting here ends up in the other place. So we, have, we don't need a collective variable, we just need a, a distance metric of how, how close am I getting, right? So the, the trajectories that get, um, uh, we, we take the gradient of, of, uh, of this, um, that is the likelihood of a simulation starting here, uh, crossing over to the other side. Um, there were a number of tricks that are, or things we had to check, but I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. At the end of the day, this uh, kind of works. You can see, for instance, this. So we start with zero crossing. We start doing just a, a regular molecular dynamics, right? There's no bias in potential yet. And as the simulations evolve in time, they feel the attraction from the other side, and we start sort of uh, seeing more and more and more simulations that cross. Um, some of some of interesting things are we need to do this from the two sides at the same time. So initialize half of the simulations in the reactant, half of the simulations in the product, and have them all sort of try to meet each other rather than just go from one side to the other because then we just learn a tilting potential that makes the products very high in energy and just everything comes out. Um, and, uh, and you can see here that we get sort of a shot at learning at the same time. Neither of them are perfect, but we get a shot at learning the bias in potential and the collective variable at the same time, right? A lot of people have thought about learning collective variables. Once you've got okay sampling, machine learning can help you learn the collective variables. And this is an example with, with just a variation, a lot encoder with a single latent dimension uh, uh, based purely on the reconstruction task, I get to sort of learn my collective variable, right? You can see how this is my reaction coordinate, right? Going from whatever, minus two to four, it doesn't have, it doesn't have a physical meaning. But it, uh, you can see sort of how the reaction coordinate uh, uh, changes along the path. This is learned from, uh, from the differentiable simulation. And then this is the bias in potential that was learned. It's not quite perfect, right? There's still a couple of bumps along the ride. The, the, the path didn't get completely diffusive, but it sort of got a shot at learning the two things at the, at the same time. There were a couple of things that we have to, that, that had to be done to, to get this to work that we were not doing originally. Um, Doing Langevin dynamics, I think it's, that's maybe kind of obvious for everybody that does uh, that. It's, it's, a, it's a very good thermostat, uh, and it really helps with sort of the chaotic nature of, of, of uh, trying to do differentiable simulations along, uh, along long simulations, right? This, this sort of mutes um, uh, the, um, uh, sort of the chaotic, chaotic behavior of, of trying to integrate across very long paths. Um, Martin, again, devised a way to do mini-batching, so we, had to, we get to pick and choose subsets of the frames of the trajectory. So we, it's the same trick as mini-batching for, uh, for stochastic gradient descent, but over subsets of the trajectory, so we get sort of multiple signals and not just an, a single signal for the full trajectory. And, and, and this is sort of what's intriguing, and, and it really helped, which is detaching the gradients um, with respect to position. So in the way we're, if we were set out to learn a bias in potential, we end up with uh, partial derivatives with respect to x and with respect to time. Um, uh, uh, sorry, with respect to x and with respect to p. Uh, but we want our, our dynamics to be non-Markovian, so we sort of drop off the dependence of the bias in potential on b, so it only depends on, um, on the momentum. I'll, I'll encourage you to ask uh, uh, Johannes all the, all the hard questions. And then how much more time do I have? Um, until 11.05 before questions, so 15 more minutes. Brilliant, okay. So then I get, uh, we did a slightly harder system. So this is a 5D Mueller-Brown potential. So it's the same potential as before, but with three confounding Gaussians. So there is, in addition to the sort of two obvious dimensions that we were optimizing over here, there is also three confounding Gaussians so over, over the um, dimensions that are not projected on the, on the plane. Uh, and you can, you can see the same idea, right? The loss gets down as, as the ends of the two simulations attract each other. Uh, every new iteration that we do the molecular dynamics over has a bias in potential that makes them uh, um, want to get closer to one another. Uh, success rate, again, from, from very early on, we, we get sort of simulations that cross over. Um, now, same trick, right? We get, uh, we, we get to learn a CV 
from a variation allowed to encode the train on all the data. So we get this CV, which again, you can see it's, it's broader than before, right? Because there is three dimensions confounded um, uh, that are sort of projected onto, onto this path. Um, and again, a bias in potential that is not perfect, um, but it's good enough, A, to have reached sort of 80% of the trajectories that cross uh, back and forth in the, in the simulation time. And with small, small enough barriers that sort of we get this diff almost diffusive behavior from left to right and, and right to left. So if one wanted to actually get sort of good uh, free energies, then one could do enhanced sampling across this CV, right? So we managed to get a good enough CV and a, and a good enough case at the bias in potential. And then this is alanine dipeptide. So this is sort of what the, the phase space or, or the amount of crossings that we see um, doing unbiased simulations. And, and this is the... Uh, uh, um, log likelihood of the bias simulations, right? So, so these are the two basins, and at the end of the differentiable molecular dynamics, we've sort of discovered the two paths, right? Like we, got, we can go around up, up top, around the bottom, or uh, because this is periodic, right, come and go down from the, from the bottom right and return from the, from the top left. And again, back uh, at, at about 100 iterations, we're already diffusing back and forth. Um, is this actually useful? We don't know yet, right? This is, uh, so the tool is there, and the question is, what are systems where, where we want to interrogate this? And uh, we're definitely intrigued by uh, molecular reactivity. So I think maybe for proteins, yeah. So a question on this, do you, do you know what is the path ensemble that you're sampling, and can you directly unbias? Yes, I mean. What I mean, can you com compute the unbiased? energy profile from the simulation and how would you do it? Um, I mean we can we can we have a path when we project the C V right on the on the VAE mm -hmm. and I think we get a this thought because I I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> let him take it. So that, uh, or maybe after the question. I would say this is not a potential of mean force because we weren't sampling that at equilibrium, right? We sort of accreted yeah, yeah, a exactly. history that's wrong. Mm. So I, I don't think we have It must a, be related to paths, these various path sampling things like transition so. interface sampling, transition paths. But every iteration yeah, is basically yeah. like an umbrella sampling run, right? Because the potential doesn't change during one epoch. And so you can, basically what we're learning is a umbrella potential, so you can always unbias it with M, M bar or a WAM. And you can get along whatever CV you choose, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, the CV we're, he's showing here is learned after the fact, right? It's, it's not anything you use during the simulation or the training. It's just learned on the trajectories to have a one-dimensional representation of everything. And here, this one just has a very fast uh, change from minus one to zero. That's why the potential looks very sharp there, but that's really just the CV. And if you, you would use anything else from those paths, the CV would look different. But the training itself doesn't use a CV as of now. But each of the, so there is 200 or 300 rounds of uh, differential simulations, and each one has a different bias in potential, right? Yeah, so which means slowly. So I, I didn't understand that point with umbrella sampling. I mean, you could do umbrella sampling. No, no, it's like umbrella sampling, right? Because um, uh, you have a bias in potential. That's the original formulation of umbrella sampling that you have flattened the PES, right? So it, it is umbrella sampling if you generate somehow, there has to be somehow an equilibrium in the individual umbrellas so that you are in local equilibrium and you can be weight. But you try to make the path kind of quickly move to the target. So this is, this is not no, equilibrium. I mean, and nowadays people it's use um, many windows in umbrella sampling, right? But in the original formulation from Tori and Velo, mm -hmm. there was just one potential, right? It was not split up in multiple windows. And... Um, this is basically what we're doing. We're learning one global biasing potential, which is not time dependent or anything. It's just position dependent. This is a potential. And um, yeah, we try to flatten the um, surface in the direction between our two welds, which we have defined. I think the question would be whether the biasing potential is, is at equilibrium, right? Whether we've just, gotten the. We still need to sample at equilibrium and the biased potential. And yeah, the, the epochs are yeah, probably we too short, as in exactly. say this is a full equilibrium. But um, if you would sample for longer, you would definitely get a mm -hmm. equilibrium bias. So this is this is what I'm saying. Like it's, this is not quite the potential of mean force yeah. because we really haven't sampled long enough in the presence of this biasing potential. Um, 
because this, each of these is short, right? It's sort of thousands of, of time steps mm. or tens of thousands. Mm. But it shouldn't be hard to just switch it on at the end. No, that's, that's, that's not the problem. Just, it's an extra number. The question, could one go back in time? I don't know if one could go back in time to the sort of 300 trajectories we've taken, each one with some bias in potential that we kind of knew. If, if there is sort of some value in, in sort of going back in time and putting all of this together, each one with its own bias in potential and, and reweigh them all together. Because it turns out we've done the sampling, we've done the sampling 300 times. I don't know, that, I don't have a good intuition. Um, so I don't, I don't know if this will work for proteins. I think our, our first interest is to try to, for chemical reactions, because there is fewer atoms, uh, and because reactant and products are very well defined. And in protein folding, like if you already know what the folded target is, well, I mean, it, it takes a little bit of fun away. And also the initial state is not really the full chain, the, the full unfolded chain. So it's not even clear what the initial state is. And then the, the last thought, and, and this was brought up yesterday, is sort of um, how, how to connect some sort of unsupervised uh, ideas uh, with coarse graining. And, and uh, Cecilia has, has made a, a great intro from, for this. They, they've got sort of a lot of work in this space. Um, back in, in 2019, we... Uh, uh, we set out to, you know, we love VAEs, so we set out to, to treat coarse graining as a VAE, um, meaning that at the same time it is possible to learn the encoding function, the decoding function, and the force matching uh, potential in the coarse grain representation. Um, and, and then sort of two things that sort of we, we uh, uh, were there, but I don't, I don't think we sort of we understood them well, uh, were referred to Cecilia yesterday, so one of the things we figured out if in that when we were learning all these things at the same time, it typically helped for this encoding function uh, to be learned such that it minimized the, the uh, instantaneous force fluctuation so that the projection of the forces uh, across this encoding function um, uh, was minimal, which relates to the, to the thing that, uh, that Cecilia said yesterday about uh, minimizing the, the noise, uh, i.e. variance. Uh, we, we sort of weren't aware of, of separating the encoding of the atom from the encoding of the forces. Um, so I, I think this sort of this, these two themes uh, relate. And then you can see some examples here of sort of uh, uh, gifts of, of uh, learning the um, assignment. And again, I think this assignment is doing two jobs at the same time in, in a way that it's not disentangled here. They're learning the uh, assignment of bits to atoms that works for coarse graining and the assignment of bits to atoms that works for, uh, for learning the force as well. And I think these two tasks are commingled in, in this example. But you can see sort of how, um, and, and because at the end of the day, we want a discrete assignment, right? We, we do gamble softmax to end up with a, a discrete mapping of bits to atoms. Uh, we were able to learn uh, interatomic potentials or, or CG potentials that work for very simple molecular liquids. They work also for, for ionic liquids. Um, in this particular example, we learned the bonded and non-bonded terms with two different neural networks, and, and that help um, generalize the, um, again, generalize across temperatures. So maybe, again, it's not quite emergence, but it's, but it's definitely generalization. And then the last thing I, I, meant, uh, I wanted to refer to is sort of this back mapping, this idea of recovering the all atom distribution um, from, the, from the bits. Uh, and again, information is lost at cold graining, right? The, by definition, the, the uh, recovery, the back mapping task is going to be um, uh, generative because coarse grain is surjective, right? We're sending many all atom uh, distributions to a single bead. So we need to be able to generate multiple all atom conformations from the same bead. Uh, so this is something we put out uh, uh, at the end of, uh, sorry, at the beginning of last year. This uh, equivariant uh, generative decoder, this was a collaboration with CES where we learn not to try to write equivariant models uh, from scratch uh, because we left out the pseudo-scalars. So <laughs> there was some version of this where everything was recovered well except for the chirality, the handedness, because it turns out there was a term that one needs to keep track of. So, so shout out to Tess for, for uh, teaching us <laughs> about pseudo-scalars. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, the flow is, is, uh, is kind of complicated, but not so much. At the end of the day, we've got sort of our full grain uh, all uh, training data, we know how to make it into coarse grain based on sort of all the stuff we described earlier. Um, uh, so we know sort of the distribution of all atom um, geometries that correspond to a certain bead. 
and then we learn a generative model that, uh, based on sort of sampling a Gaussian, reproduces this, uh, this all atom distributions condition on the CG bits, right? So we can drop off the, the all atom encoder and just sample all atom distributions from the, from the position of the CG bits. Um, so there's a couple of tricks about sort of which atoms get to talk with which other atoms. Um, but essentially, this, this does a pretty good job at path mapping. So um, these are examples for alanine dipeptide, which is kind of trivial, OK. Um, but you can see that, uh, I don't know how big, uh, look OK. You can see the, the, the distribution of geometries. So the smaller, the fewer the bits, um, the broader the distribution of geometries that lives inside each bead, which is sort of qualitatively correct. Whereas when, when there is uh, lots of bits and, and the coarse grain model is very high resolution, the only thing that survives sort of the, the back mapping, the only actual ensembling is over rotations of, of methyls, right? Which is kind of a trivial um, generative uh, problem. So we compare here with uh, um, a linear uh, back mapping, which is what we had in the original VAE formulation, a non-equivariant, uh, non-message passing multilayer perceptron, and sort of the new method we propose. And in general, it, it does a good job at reproducing the um, all atom sort of side chain distributions based on CGBs. With, with, uh, this is uh, chignolin coarse grain into 10 beads. Um, and, and you can see that we recover sort of the position of the all atom system with about uh, um, uh, less than an Armstrong accuracy. And then this is, this is about, sorry? Can you comment on the metric for what the distribution matching is? Because yes. You, you want the distributions to match, yes. not just to recover all the states. So that's, yeah, that's absolutely 100% correct. And uh, that's exactly, I, I don't think we were extremely thorough about that in that paper, but we've been in this next one that's coming. So 100% uh, uh, great question. Um, so this is uh, uh, Gen C prod C as in the, as in the uh, um, internal coordinates. So instead of, uh, back then we were doing Cartesian coordinates, so throwing the atoms out in X, Y, Z in an equivariant fashion, yeah, but, but it's kind of hard. Uh, it turns out people have thought very deeply about internal coordinates already, so it's, it's, it, they make a sort of a very natural basis to project atoms along, right? So you already know things to need to be bonded, need to be, uh, have angles, need to have dihedrals, and this will go back to the distribution argument. So uh, essentially the same idea with some a little bit more rigor on, on the, on the um, uh, on the uh, geometric arguments to reconstruct. And then instead of, because the previous model was sort of a one-off, there was one back mapping uh, for every protein training data, so it wasn't sort of really generalizable. This has been trained on, on data from PED, which contains protein structural ensembles. It's a, it's a beast, PED. There is sort of things that come from molecular dynamics, things that come uh, from, uh, from uh, NMR. So it's not homogeneous data, but it definitely covers conformational space across many proteins. And like I said, um, we added an internal coordinate decoder, so it, it tracks sort of, you know, the carbon alpha projects to the carbon beta and sort of uh, 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 uses uh, that as a basis to grow the, the side chain in internal coordinates. And then we weren't doing this before, but now we do message passing between the all atom system and the CG bits as they're being built, right? A little bit and, and not a little bit, 100% uh, uh, borrowed the code from a uh, from, uh, colleague's group and the uh, equivariant uh, ligand generator inside proteins. And maybe, again, in the, in the topic of emergence, we added a bunch of terms to the laws of things we care about and we're not getting picked up, including steric clashes. Someone, uh, Mohammed mentioned steric clashes back in the day. Yes? So uh, can we uh, back map a certain snapshot, let's say we have a trajectory of coarse grain system and uh, we have some uh, we have some phenomena that we want to observe at a very large time scale and after that we ran the coarse grain simulation, we want to actually get the atomistic details and can we back map that snapshots to get the fine grain structure? Yes, so that's, that's the aspiration. I think the first model we did meant that, you know, it, it kind of geometrically was possible, right, with, with the equivariant decoder. I think it it, uh, it seemed like it was possible, and now we're getting to a point where I think it can be trusted. Um, the reason we started doing this in the first place is to do active learning, because again, to do coarse graining, I mean, proteins are very transferable. They're always the same amino acid. There is lots of data, but if you move to materials, you know, there's like two simulations of polyethylene oxide with these pendants, right? So uh, in a world where there is not infinite data to train a coarse grained uh, potential, 
we are going to need active learning. The same trick we do for force fields, we're going to need it for coarse grain force fields, unless you have all the phase space already to start with. So the, the aspiration is to do some sort of multi-scale approach where start somewhere, coarse grain, explore phase space, come back to reality. And again, if you're doing protein-protein contacts, it probably helps to, to up-resolve. So, so the aspiration is, yes, up-resolve after CG. And, and like at the last point where we want to fine grain the system, do we need to train it again to get the... Yes, it depends. Yeah, no, no, it's like... Once it's working, no. Once it's working, you should be done and, and trust the, the bug mapping. In practice, based on everything we've seen so far and sort of the challenges of learning generalizable, I think the first two or three generations of this will be an active learning loop where we, we make some large protein or protein complex, run it with CG, get to see second scales, right? And then once, once we think that's the contacts they're in, up sample, run, uh, uh, you know, a nanosecond, right? A fraction of a nanosecond. Just see how everything equilibrates and back map, uh, sorry, and course grain again and, and uh, iteratively improve. So in practice, yes, there's going to be uh, iterative improvement. Uh, in theory, we would love for this to be uh, a final. So where do we are in, where are we in terms of uh, performance? So much, much better than before for a couple of reasons. One, we get to train on lots of different proteins and finally back map amino acids in a, in a transferable way. Uh, so the, the reconstruction loss is now 0.5 RMSD, when it used to be uh, more closer to, um, to 2. That's the ballpark of sort of what uh, um, um, uh, AlphaFold was, was getting, right? It's sort of 2 uh, 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 Anstron RMSD. So this was sort of could be thought as sort of for a, if one gets the, to put the carbon alpha in, in the right sort of secondary tertiary structure, a tool like this could sort of populate all the side chains uh, in, in a reasonable way. We did lots of ablation studies about what things help. So the C matrix helps a lot. Equivariance helps, as, as we had seen in the in the past. But internal coordinates makes our life much easier. This is the graph edit distance. Uh, I, I got the distributions in the next slide. This is the graph edit distance because we definitely don't want to be breaking bones, right? Like 0 0.2 Armstrongs is, is a, a broken bone and a, and a nonsensical answer. So we're, we're very careful about reconstructing all the bonds and, and connectivities correctly. And you can see that the, the loss is very, very low now. And then on the distribution side, here's one example, uh, Patrick, and I've got a lot more. But you can see blue is true, yellow is reconstruction, and uh, pink is, is sampling. So this, this one is behaving reasonably well for that. Uh, uh, this is a carboxylic acid talking to a, quarter, a positively charged amine on, on another sort of uh, residue, right? So these two side chains should be attracted to one another because they have opposite charges and, and we're getting sort of the right distribution. Whereas in, in our earlier examples, these two side chains were being reconstructed independently and they were not aware of, of one another on the side. And this is of a broader set of um, um, examples. Typically it's working well. I would say the one place where we should be able to do better and it goes back maybe to a Boltzmann generator argument, is that many of these things are ex angles and the hydra, sorry, angles and, and the bond distances are Gaussians. So they're easy to reconstruct from a VAE. Torsions are multimodal distributions, and VAE with Gaussian priors don't do great. So typically, you can see maybe some of these examples, right? So blue here is the true distribution for this torsion. Surprise, surprise, torsions are hard. Um, so we got sort of multiple local uh, maxima. And you can see that reconstruction in orange does a little bit better. But sampling just gives you the average torsion, right? Because it, it really struggles to learn a sort of multimodal uh, distribution. So, yeah. Why would you not use VAE with a mixture of Gaussians? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> because the deadline for ICLR is, uh, the, sorry, for, uh, uh, for the conference is the day after tomorrow. But, uh, but yes, definitely, definitely some uh, either, either a mixture of Gaussians or, uh, or a, a, a diffusion or a flow-based model sort of to, to uh, turn, yeah. I, I think I've been ignoring your question for a while. I apologize. No, it's okay. Uh, so, well, I guess on this question, I mean, you're, are you, you're not uh, trying to take into account like periodic, uh, you just treat it as like an interval? For the angle or something like that? Or? Uh, the torsions, yeah, the torsions are periodic, so the loss is periodic, the torsional loss is periodic. I mean, the model that's trying to generate it, does it know that it's periodic? Uh, periodic? Yes, because since it reconstructs in Z matrix, in C matrix we can have sort of a, a periodic uh, loss, meaning that it really knows that 179 degrees, we didn't in the first iteration. I mean, a lot of stuff, but I mean, does the model naturally uh, encode the No. Periodic? Yeah. 
there are some generative models that can deal with the you know those kinds of like poor eye and sphere and that kind of stuff. So, okay. Um, but I was going to ask a different question. Going back, maybe like a couple of slides. Just uh, when you're doing the course, yeah, here when you're doing the course graining, it wasn't clear to me like are there different kinds of things that map into one bead, or like you always have the same. Uh, set of atoms and the same sequence of atoms and things like that. Like, because you're talking about generalizable and transferable, and I don't really know in what sense you're Yes, doing. so uh, especially in protein world, one amino acid should be one bead. It, it's hard to make an argument for something else. So we could learn learnable mappings where two adjacent alanines are bead type uh, 234, whereas uh, in a different protein they don't need to be. So it would be possible to learn sort of but you're always fixing it. Like when bead has a clear, so like the yes. what it decodes into in terms of atoms is like a Yes, every bead. So in coarse green, every bead needs to correspond always to the same type of atoms. I don't think we can, we can change, uh, you know, that some atoms sometimes make one bead, but sometimes don't, right? The same atoms need to make the, the same bead, right? That, that mapping function is, is permanent. It's natural, I just wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were talking about transferable if you meant them. Yeah. Uh, do you mean to other chemistries? I think uh, we're, we're going to take a step. I don't know. It seems hard to right now, but yeah, we could aspire to make a universal back mapping. So um, I'm, I'm running out of time. So just a big shout out to the team, uh, you know, for the for the assist and uh, and for coming in uh, to LA to help out. Thanks. <laughs>